Richard uh, met on, once we decided on Boston, we tossed out a couple of names for who might be the keynote speaker. I threw out this name, Neil Gershenfeld, and I did a little research. And our director for uh, education, Darcy Thompson, said she looked him up on the web, on the web, on the TED speech, and it made her head spin. And I said, uh, that's what we want. So anyway, the, uh, the uh, APMM, I also had a, a book review done on the e-newsletter, and I had Dennis Heinzeroth write a book review of two of his books. And Dennis's conclusion was that he thought he was reading the history of the future. And what could be more valuable than that if you're trying to figure out where model making is going and where the future potential is? So basically, Neil is going to talk about his fab labs, and where he's, he's seen, he sees things heading, and for the last 10 years at least, he's been right. So I would look at this as a future opportunity, something you should look into, uh, what's different about fab labs and those kinds of things we've been talking about. But I think what you'll see out there is a gigantic market if you can figure out how to capitalize on it. And I think you'll also see that you are the best people in the world in terms of background with, with knowing software and knowing how to build things and rapid prototyping to take advantage of this gigantic market that's expanding. It's very different, just like the digital age has changed other industries. So uh, I, I, I came to the conclusion years ago in working with, with uh, in model making that maybe the if there was a mantra or a theme for model making, it's tomorrow, today, delivered yesterday because of all the pressures that we have. And so, so I think that uh, Neil is a good, a, a good person to come up and talk about what tomorrow is going to be like, which will be today very soon, and it's today already in Fab Labs. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Neil Gershenko. This group, what I'd like to talk about is why you're more important than you realize, have more opportunity than you might realize, and are also more threatened than you might realize because of the merging of the world of bits and the world of atoms. So in about the next 45 minutes, I want to step back to look at how the world of information in computers relates to the world we live in out here, some of the science and then show a lot of the very unexpected things that are exploding at that intersection all around the world. So, academia, industry are all split between hardware and software, bits and atoms. And th th this meeting lives somewhere around hardware manufacturing. But nature doesn't work that way. Nature doesn't distinguish physical science and computer science. Everything happens everywhere all the time and interacts. And so the program I directed at MIT, the Center for Bits and Atoms, is a group of people like me who never understood this boundary between physical science and computer science. And we do research across all length scales and all disciplines, but right where information meets physical properties. So let me show you some examples. This is one of our experimental apparatuses. We went to MIT one day to the media lab, and that's where you truly feel like Forrest Gump. You walk around there, and know. you're walking, and there's people basically who have thoughts of things that haven't and will not happen yet, but you're going, what is pretty, pretty. <laughs> Talking about quantum computing, where they say the entire memory of the world is going to one bad talk, and you're going, and I guess I shouldn't finish it. <laughs> so we did the first complete non-trivial quantum computation in the world by programming nuclear spins uh, in, in liquids, which Robin was very struck by. Um, this was a project where what I'm going to show you is microscopic pictures of high-speed video of bubbles. And this is a computer. This is a memory. And these are logic gates. And so these are calculations. Again, this is high-speed video slowed down. So this is digital logic, just like you know it, but the bits transport material. So if you want to print or synthesize reactions or control hydraulics, instead of connecting the computer to the machine, the materials themselves do, do the computation. Or um, this is a CAD CAM workflow for um, engineering a protein fold. If you want to make something, instead of turning it into a tool path, you, you send it, take your CAD file and send it into the string, and the string contains a code that folds into the shape that you want to make. Oops. 
And that workflow of coded assembly we're building in DNA proteins and nanoclusters and microfluidics and micromechanical systems uh, in macro systems, it's in robotic systems that can turn into any shape. So it's, 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 like, it's, it's like a robot that works like a protein that can turn into anything. And um, this is a new way to program computers that are part of these projects, where instead of the computer program being lines of code, the computer program is, is a structure. So right now, this is an example of a computer program. And what it's doing is multiplying matrices in a time that's linear in the size of the matrix. And it does it not as lines of code, but as making sort of physical structures that compute as a programming model. And so now if you zoom out from all of those examples, you get that communication was analog, got worse with distance and now with the internet. Computers used to be analog. Vannevar Bush made this at MIT, the last great analog computer. It was a room full of gears and pulleys, and the longer it ran, the worse the computation was. We now have Pentiums. Um, but manufacturing is analog. Um, MIT did the first NC machining, taking an air defense computer and connecting it to a milling machine for, for uh, aerospace parts. But the information is in the computer, in the tool, metal, wax, and mel metal. And about the only real advance on this today is now you can melt plastic instead of whacking at metal. But the material doesn't contain information. In the examples I showed you, the computer isn't controlling a tool. The computer is the tool. The program isn't describing a thing. The program is the thing. And that's not a new insight. That's how molecular biology works. The, the, the motors in your arm or the light sensors in your eye are made by a protein that reads a code in proteins that then builds proteins. The information is in the system. The, 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 the system becomes the part. That's digital fabrication, exactly like Shannon and my mind and taught us. When you digitize things, you can correct errors, you can build hierarchy, you can make things much more complex. And so we're just about to go through a revolution as big as the transition from analog to digital communication and computation, but now it's going to be out here in the physical world we live in. This isn't computers connected to milling machines and glue gun squirters. It's actually putting codes into materials that become thick, merging the computation with the material. That may sound a little adventurous, a little further out, but it's exactly what happened to communication and computation, and it's what all the research I, uh, before I showed you is doing. So we're just at the edge of this revolution where we're going to be able to program physical reality. Um, now to do that research, we put together a suite of tools that let us do input and output from nanometers to meters. So ion nanoprobes, next to micro-machining, and litter jet cutting, and all the scanning tools that go with them. And then I had a problem, which was it would take years of MIT classes to learn to work all the tools. So I started a class, how to make almost anything, which was just for a few research students who wanted to search to use the tools. But in the class, for, with room for 10 people, the first time I taught it, it looked like this room. There was just a sea of people desperate to take it. And then the next surprise is, they weren't there to do research or start companies. They were there because they wanted to make stuff. And then the next surprise is the kind of stuff they made.